In the 1500s, according to the Italian artist Federico Saccaro, the word disegno had two separate meanings. Disegno interno was the initial visual idea playing inside the internal mind of the artist, while disegno esterno was the physical action of drawing the inspired flourishes of the mental visions onto a piece of paper. Disegno was basically the visual imagination at play for innovative narrative ideas. These drawings were usually sketchy and incomplete to the viewer. However, such scribbles would already be envisioned as a potential painting or sculpture in the mind's eye of a master artist. Examples of such sketches follow. The usual media for disegno esterno sketches was ink. Sometimes over quick drawn lines of black chalk, ink washes were applied to decide the general compositional flow of movement, balance, and the placing of basic light and dark patterns. However, the immediate depiction of spatial depth would be noted at the start of every disegno sketch. According to a Renaissance painter's mindset, a delicate union of lights and shades were to best set off important subjects and objects against each other and against their backgrounds. For instance, notice in the drawing of the Adoration of the Magi on the right. The figures in the upper right are dark against a light background, and the foreground figures are spotlighted against a mid-tone background. In the right sketch, note the hatch lines of shading to immediately indicate depth upon the figures and the direction of light to be in the painting. There was another element to consider at the disegno stage of a composition. Both these sketches here were approached as large figures within a small compass. In other words, the subjects are large, up front, and close, held within a small, confined picture space. Here again we see large figures within a small compass. To be noted in this ink drawing is the subtle application of background set-offs through lights and shades. The fallen woman is the principal figure of the narrative, thus her shaded side of the body sharply contrasts with the light background, while her highlighted arms and face are against a mid-tone background. The secondary figure of the man on the right to her, who is mostly in shadow, also stands out amid a mid-tone ground. The face and the uplifted surprised hands of the third figure in the middle are well emphasized against their backgrounds to add to the action of the narrative. Also to be noted, the fallen woman is slightly more detailed with darker shadows when compared to the second man. Details and shades become less prominent in the third figure and especially in the partial figure indicated on the far right. This visual consideration was a means to understand the spatial depth of the disegno through the Renaissance concept of distant grounds, as explained in the next slide. In compositions known as small figures within a large compass, darks and lights were employed as distant grounds to give the sense of depth, expansiveness, and a thickness of air effect. Note the three distant grounds in the drawing. The foreground would be the three horse riders and the tree to the left. Notice that their shadows are darker with more detail in heavier line work. The middle ground consists of more groups of horse and riders and are less detailed and lighter in shades. The offscape, or horizon, consists of the city against the sky. There are four distant grounds in the painting. The first distant ground is the foreground. This would be the horse and rider groups to include a dog and tree trunks in the lower right corner. 
Notice that the colors are more intense and warmer with strong reds and a golden yellow glow. A European 17th century master knew from direct observation of nature that warm colors of reds and yellows project forward while cool colors of blues, greens, or purples recede back. The second distant ground includes the two trees to the left and the center group of riders in the shadows. They are painted with less detail and in muted warm colors. The third ground is the building and its surrounding trees. Note that this area is painted in blue-green tones when compared to the warm olive and yellow-green trees in the foregrounds. The fourth distant ground is the expanse of land to the far offscape or horizon, painted with lesser detail and cooler colors to give a thickness of air effect, also considered as aerial perspective. Here is another example of small figures in a large compass, as noticed by figures receding into the fading distance when compared to the stronger shadows and details of the foreground figures, animals, and structures. Here is another consideration of small figures in a large compass. Note also the successively fading distant grounds. Distant grounds could also apply to portraits with a landscape. Notice in the DeSegno drawing how the artist considered the generalized backgrounds of lights and shades to help set off certain aspects of the composition. The highest light and the darkest shadows remain on the figure. Of interest, this lady is an artist, as indicated by the brushes, the shells filled with paint, and the watercolor painting on paper at the lower left corner. Here we see a disegno of a still life arranged in a landscape with evident distant grounds applied. Note the scribbled out statue in the background as a change of mind by the artist. When looking at many 17th century landscape drawings and paintings, one will consistently see this conscious incorporation of distant grounds. In review, the first ground of this Lorraine drawing consists of the stump in the lower left corner, the figures, and the grove of dark trees. Note the darker shades, heavier line work, and detailing. The second ground consists of the bridge and part of the hillside. The third ground includes the trees on top of the hill in line with the ruin. The fourth ground is the far horizon showing a distant city and a lake. A popular 17th century concept was to incorporate a pathway to invite a viewer into the wonders of a landscape painting. In this example, we see a stone bridge which connects the foreground with the midground. Note the red chalk lines converging in the center. This has to do with a unique 17th century viewing perspective concept regarding vantage point. For a large painting commission, deciding where it would hang was especially important when considering the disegno. One factor for a site-specific painting installation included the light direction, by which the external light source upon the painting hanging on the wall must match the same light direction depicted in the painting. Another consideration was how the painting would be best viewed from an onlooker's vantage point or observation position. Thus, the following had to be predetermined in the disegno workup. The horizon level, point of sight, the visual cone of widening rays with its intersections, and the receding points of an imaginary squared floor, all to work in accord with the room or area where the painting was to be installed. 
This viewing perspective principle is the very first drawing lesson explained in many of the 17th century manuals for the art student. An image from such a book is in the upper right corner. Once a drawing was finalized for the compositional design, it was usually transferred in one of three methods. This small drawing, only seven and a half by eight and a quarter inches, demonstrates the squared transfer method. Since sheets of paper were an extremely expensive commodity, a squared transfer enabled a small drawing to be enlarged onto a huge panel or wall, in this case, requiring the squares to be numbered. For instance, one inch squares can be enlarged to one foot squares and the drawing would be carefully redrawn from square to square in the larger size. Additional examples follow. Another transfer method was through the use of a same size cartoon drawing which acted as a template. Since a sheet of paper in the 16th and 17th centuries was no larger than roughly 18 by 24 inches, paper was glued together to create this cartoon drawing for a same size panel. Note the size of this drawing, four foot, six and three quarter inches by three foot and three and three quarter inches. Originally, Da Vinci's cartoon was just a simple outline drawing. Portions of it can be seen in the bottom feet and on the upright hand with a pointing finger. The outline was pricked or perforated with a sharp needle. Then it was secured on top of a prepared same size panel. Charcoal dust was pounced through the pricked holes and upon removing the cartoon, a faint dotted line could be seen of the entire outlined drawing. These lines were reinforced with ink, metal point, or oil paint. Once dry, the charcoal was swept away with a feather and the painting would commence. The cartoon itself was sometimes worked up into a detailed drawing, as Leonardo did here in the soft rendering of lights and shadows. Here we see two more cartoons which show, in the close-ups, the perforated pattern for transfer. One can see how closely the punctures were placed and what features were important to be transcribed. The Holbein drawing on the right began as an outline drawing to establish the pinholes. After charcoal dust was pounced on the surface to complete the transfer, the drawing was then worked up to a finished look. This was apparently not the case for the Voltero drawing on the left which was first a completed lead or metal point drawing, a medium that does not erase. Pricked holes were applied on top of the finished drawing for the pouncing of charcoal dust. The conclusion for this is based on the specific manner of perforations around particular shadowed areas, such as around the nose and under the eyes. This tedious job of transferring a cartoon was usually assigned to an apprentice, assistant, or family member. Another method was to place a sheet smudged with charcoal between the cartoon and the panel, like today's carbon paper, and with a stylus, the outline of the drawing would be traced, creating a charcoal imprint on the panel surface. This method enabled a cartoon to be used over and over to create a mass production of identical paintings in the hands of workshop assistants, as be the case in these two Holbein paintings. The original by the master is on the left. Unfortunately, many of these cartoons have not survived because the overuse would eventually cause the paper fibers to weaken and tear. Of interest, I include the translation of the inscription Pause the lecture now if you wish to read it.